Hello, I'm Reverend Neely Hicks with Glencliff United Methodist Church, and I want to share with you today a message from our morning study. We'll begin with this passage from Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord in one. Breathe deeply. Center yourselves. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord in one. Today's study scripture comes from the book of Acts in the New Testament. It's an odd book because it's not one of the Gospels and it's not one of the letters. It's wedged between the Gospel of John and Paul's letter to the Romans, but it's thought to be authored by the same person as the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke. But instead of it being about Jesus, the book of Acts is a narrative about the first disciples of Jesus after his resurrection. The passage we're going to hear happens after the disciples, Peter and John, healed a man who couldn't walk as he begged for money outside the temple in Jerusalem. So I'm reading now from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 12 through 19, and I'll just share my screen with you so that you can see this along with me. Just get up on the screen. It takes me so long. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety, we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. So this passage is one that actually speaks to um, not only people who are of the Jewish faith tradition in at that point in time, but also to the Roman leaders. Um, remember that it was a group of people who wanted Jesus to be executed. It was not just the Jews, as some believe in our world. Um, I think this passage has been contorted and distorted, um, where it has created a lot of hate towards Faith, the Jewish faith tradition, Judaism itself. And we must remember that Christ was Jewish and his followers were Jewish. They were Jewish and they believed also in Jesus as the Messiah. Let's look a little bit deeper at the passage. Peter and John had healed someone at the temple. So this man who was sitting outside begging just like you and I see people begging on the streets of our cities 
Um, and when the disciples, um, Peter and John, approached him, they said, we do not give you, we cannot give you silver or gold, but we will give you what we have. And for them, that was the power of Jesus Christ living within them. And because they knew him and followed him. And so they claimed in Jesus' name, rise and walk. And the man did. It was a miracle. And people, sometimes when they see miracles, sometimes when they see love in all of its glory, they don't like it. It casts shadows, doesn't it? Of when you see something that is beautiful, you might think, oh, well, I didn't do that, or that person isn't good enough to have received healing. Why did he get healed and not this person who is righteous? And so all of those things were coming against Peter and John as they stood before others who, instead of rejoicing at this man being able to walk again, they were angry about it. So Peter said to them, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the God of our ancestors, reminding the people that they all worship the same God. Yes, they were Jewish and they followed Christ. And so this was, was the message that they wanted to get across to people. They Peter got angry, though, and he said in verses 14 and 15, you rejected the holy and righteous one. You killed the author of life. So this passage can get a little tricky if you don't remember that both the Roman and Jewish authorities had a role in the death of Jesus and that Peter himself is Jewish. Christian tradition for centuries interpreted Luke and Acts as a basis for anti-Semitism. In cultures influenced by American evangelism, this has often led to forms of Christian exceptionalism. Too often, we forget that regardless of what one believes or doesn't believe, we are created by the same God. So in the New Interpreter Study Bible, Barbara Reed tells us when Jewish Christians spoke of Jews who put Jesus to death, the intra-Jewish Jewish nature of the conflict was clear. But when Christians who are no longer Jews speak of the Jews as being responsible for the death of Jesus, there's a whole other nuance that fuels anti-Judaism. Luke's narratives must be understood in both their historical and theological contexts. At the same time, they must not be used to foment or expand anti-Semitism. So just as easy, just as it's easy for us to slip into anti-Semitism without understanding context, we also must not cast Peter as an anti-Semite because he was Jewish himself. So we know that the crimes against people of the Jewish faith tradition are rampant. There's hate crimes throughout our world. Um, we know that especially over this last four to five years, there has been a rise in hate crimes in the U.S. against Jewish people. And so um, it is imperative that we recognize when this happens in our world and that we stand against it and we stand with other people of other faith traditions. That is what we're called to do is to live the love of Christ. And that means including everyone in that love and care and protection. Um, we know that during the insurrection, Many people wore T-shirts that had, um, I think it was 6MWE. And if you look that up, you'll see that 6MWE stands for 6 million wasn't enough. 6 million was not enough. 
that's what the insurrectionists, many of them were wearing wow. as they stormed our Capitol on January 6. And the 6 million has to do with how many Jewish people lost their lives wow. during the Holocaust. This is something, something happening right here and now in the United States. And it's something wow. that we have to stand against as faithful Christians. I want to share my screen again, and if, hopefully I'll get to it faster this time. But um, we are going to go to the social principles of the United Methodist Church. So when you join the United Methodist Church, there's a book of social principles that talk about applications to the gospel in society and culture. So this one is about the rights of religious minorities. Religious persecution has been common in the history of civilization. We urge policies and practices that ensure the right of every religious group, every religious group, every Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Baha'i, Hindu, every religious group to exercise its faith free from legal, political, or economic restrictions. We condemn all overt and covert forms of religious intolerance. And you know, there's a lot of that going on with our political leaders at this point in time, being especially sensitive to their expression in media stereotyping, especially. We assert the right of all religions and their adherence to freedom from legal, economic, and social discrimination. So as United Methodist, this is how we, we look upon religious pluralism. Um, we are accepting of it. And we know that where there have been countries, where there are countries where you are simply born into the religion of the country, those religions don't come alive. You know, it's kind of like, if you are born a citizen of the United States, you are less likely to know your American history than you will if you are an immigrant coming into the country and learning things in order to take your citizenship test. So there's something about God's prevenient grace going before us and beckoning us towards God in a way that embraces who we are, the context of where we live, and the life that we're meant to live. Um, there's something special about being able to move into that without it being mandated upon us. And so we, as United Methodists, don't want a state religion um, because we know that that's not the religion that actually is most likely to lead people to God in God's fullness. So we know today too that across the world, individuals and groups are persecuted because one religious group sees its values and beliefs primary to those of other religious adherents for those or those of no religious preference at all. So the United Methodist social principles, which urge policies and practices that ensure the right of every religious group to exercise its faith, free from legal, political, and economic restrictions, that, that is the place that we want to be so that everyone can embrace God who is present within us all, and that we can move more towards being perfected in love than perfected in religion. We want to be perfected in love so that in all ways we can embrace God in all people and in all creation throughout the world. I hope this message has blessed you today. And I think it would be great if you wanted to continue your study you could read the book Night by Elie Wiesel, or you could also read The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. Those two books kind of help us empathize better with some of the 
hate at its extreme that is possible when we do not stand with our brothers and sisters of different faith traditions. May God bless you.